welcome to our third and final program by Reading Aloud. And today is Beast, Bugs, and Birds, and it was curated by Nancy Lynch. And Ina, if you'd like, like to come up and say a few words. Thank you very much for attending. We've had a great turnout this time around, and hopefully next year we'll have a bigger turnout. Good afternoon. This is our last program to celebrate National <coughs> Poetry Month, and it's certainly been a big celebration, so we're very glad that you're here. And it's Nancy Lynch, please stand, who has selected the topic and chosen the poems. And we're very grateful for her work. And we're also today thinking about Jim Curry, whose birthday this is, and who unfortunately died and left reading aloud in the fall. He was a wonderful reader, and he introduced us to many poems because of his very deep knowledge of poetry. So we are thinking of Jim today and missing him whenever we read. So now I will introduce the readers, Kathy Mitchell, Michael Chan, Chuck Felling, you should at least wave. <laughs> Nancy, Mary Gutman, Carrie Malone, Connie Peterson, Betty Norbeck. I think I have everybody. Okay, and now we will begin, but not with me. <laughs> Good afternoon. Her First Calf by Wendell Berry. Her fate seizes her and brings her down. She is heavy with it. It rings her. The great weight is heaved out of her. It eases. She moves into what she has become, sure in her fate now, as a fish free in the current. She turns to the calf who has been broken out of the womb's water and its veil. He breathes. She licks his wet hair. He gathers his legs under him and rises. He stands and his legs wobble. After the months of his pursuit of her, now they meet face to face. From the beginnings of the world, his arrival and her welcome have been prepared. They have always known each other. Little Citizen, Little Survivor by Hayden Carruth. <clears throat> Excuse me. A brown rat has taken up residence with me. A little brown rat with pinkish ears and lovely almond shaped eyes. He and his wife live in the wood pile by my back door, and they are so equal I cannot tell which is which when they poke their noses out of the crevices among the sticks of firewood and then venture further in search of sunflower seeds spilled from the feeder. I can't tell you, my friend, how glad I am to see them. I haven't seen a fox for years, or a mink, or a fisher cat, or an eagle, or a porcupine. I haven't seen any of my old company of the woods and the fields. We used to live in such close affection and admiration. Well, I remember when the coons would tap on my window, when the ravens would speak to me from the edge of their little precipice. Where are they now? Everyone knows, gone, scattered in this terrible dispersal. But at least the brown rat that most people so revile and fear and castigate has brought his wife with, to live with me again. Welcome, little citizen. Little survivor, lend me your presence, and I will lend you mine. Mm -hmm. 
Dharma by Billy Collins. The way the dog trots out the front door every morning without a hat or an umbrella, without any money, or the keys to her doghouse, never fails to fill the saucer of my heart with milky admiration. Who provides a finer example of life without encumbrance? Thoreau in his curtainless hut with a single plate, a single spoon. Gandhi with his staff and his holy diapers. Off she goes into the material world with nothing but her brown coat and her modest blue collar. Following only her wet nose, the twin portals of her steady breathing, followed only by the plume of her tail. If only she did not shove the cat aside every morning and eat all his food, what a model of self-containment she would be. What a paragon of earthly detachment. If only she were not so eager for a rub behind her ears, so acrobatic in her welcomes. If only I were not her God. So now you're going to have to really listen, right? Because we don't have that light show coming up anymore. <laughs> trout. And I did see trout up there. See if you can get it up there. Okay, Trout by Seamus Haney. <laughs> Let me wait to you. Yeah, wait until Ooh, this, is kind of, this is a little disorienting. Sorry. That's quite all right. There it is. Okay, thank you. Trout by Seamus Haney. Hangs a fat gun barrel deep under arched bridges or slips like butter down the throat of the river. From depths smooth skinned as plums, his muzzle gets bullseye picks off grass seed and moths that vanish torpedoed. Where water unravels over gravel beds, he is fired from the shallows, white belly reporting flat, darts like a tracer, bullet back between stones, and is never burnt out. A volley of cold blood, ramrodding the current. I'm thinking that you may change your attitude towards some creatures as a result of these poems. For example, rats. And for this one that I'm about to read called Bats. Bats by Randall Jarrow. A bat is born naked and blind and pale. His mother makes a pocket of her tail and catches him. He clings to her long fur by his thumbs and toes and teeth. And then the mother dances through the night, doubling and looping, soaring, somersaulting. Her baby hangs on underneath. All night in happiness, she hunts and flies. Her sharp cries like shining needle points of sound go out into the night and echoing back, tell her what they have touched. She hears how far it is how big it is, which way it's going. She lives by hearing. The mother eats the moths and gnats she catches in full flight. In full flight, the mother drinks the water of the pond she skims across. Her baby hangs on tight. Her baby drinks the milk she makes him in moonlight or starlight, in midair, their single shadow printed on the moon or fluttering across the stars. Worlds on all night. At daybreak, the tired mother flaps home to her rafter. The others are all there. They hang themselves up by their toes. They wrap themselves in their brown wings, bunched upside down. They sleep in air. Their sharp ears, their sharp teeth, their quick, sharp faces are dull and slow and mild. All the bright day, as the mother sleeps, she folds her wings about her sleeping child.
Destruction by Joanne Kiger. First of all, do you remember the way a bear goes through a cabin when nobody is home? He goes through the front door. I mean, he really goes through it. Then he takes the cupboard off the wall and eats a can of lard. He eats all the apples, limes, dates, bottled decaffeinated coffee, and 35 pounds of granola. The asparagus soup cans fall to the floor. Yum. He chomps up the Norwegian crackers, stashed for the winter, and the bouillon, salt, pepper, paprika, garlic, onions, potatoes. He rips the <coughs> green tea poster from the wall, tries the Coleman mustard, spills the ink, tracks in the flour, goes upstairs and takes a shit. Rips open the waterbed, eats the incense, and drinks the perfume. Knocks over the Japanese tansu and the Persian miniature of a man on horseback watching a woman bathing. Knocks shelter, whole earth catalog, planet drum, northern mists, truck tarks, and women's sports into the oozing waterbed. He goes downstairs and out the back wall. He keeps on going for a long way and finds a good cave to sleep it all off. Luckily, he ate the whole medicine cabinet, including stash of LSD, peyote, psilocybin, amanita, benzedrine, valium, and aspirin. I'm going to just say a couple of words. Um, our topic being uh, beasts, birds, and bugs. I'm wearing a bug. I have a bird <laughs> pin. And, well, this one isn't a bug. It's a spider. <laughs> and my poem that I'm going to read is a bison. So they all begin with B. <laughs> bison crossing near Mount Rushmore. There is our herd of cars stopped staring respectively at the line of bison crossing. One big fronted bull nudges his cow into a run. She and her calf are first to cross. In swift dignity, the dark-coated caravan sweeps through the gap our cars leave in the two-way stall on the road to the presidents. The polygamous bulls guarding their families from the rear, the honey-brown calves trotting head to tip, hip, by their mothers, who are lean and muscled as bulls, with chin tassels and curved horns, all leap the road like a river and run. The strong and somber remnant of Western freedom disappears into the rough grass of the draw around the point of the mountain. The bison, orderly, disciplined by the prophet-faced, heavy-headed fathers treading the paths of our awestruck station wagons. Airstreams and trailers, if in dread of us, give no sign. Go where their leaders twine them over the prairie, and we keep to our line, staring, stirring, revving, idling motors, moving each behind the other, herd like, where the highway leads. Two poems by Robert Frost. First one, Fireflies in the Garden. Here come real stars to fill the upper skies, and here on earth come emulating flies that though they never equal stars in size, and they were never really stars at heart, achieve at times a very star-like start. Only, of course, they can't sustain the part. Second, Blue Butterfly Day. It is Blue Butterfly Day here in spring, and with these sky flakes down in flurry on flurry, 
there's more unmixed color on the wing. Then flowers will show for days unless they hurry. But these are flowers that fly and all but sing. And now from having ridden out desire, they lie closed over in the wind and cling where wheels have freshly sliced the April mire. The Skylark by John Clare. The rolls and harrows lie at rest beside the battered road, and spreading far and wide above the russet clods, the corn is seen sprouting its spiry points of tender green. Where squats the hare, to terrors wide awake? Like some brown clod, the harrows fail to break. Upon their golden caskets to the sun, the buttercups make schoolboys eager run to see who shall be first to pluck the prize. Up from their hurry, see, the skylark flies, and o'er her half-formed nest with happy wings winnows the air, till in the cloud she sings then hangs a dust spot in the sunny skies and drops and drops till in her nest she lies, which they unheeded passed, not dreaming then that birds which flew so high would drop again to nests upon the ground, which anything may come at to destroy. Had they the wing like such a bird, themselves would be too proud and build on nothing but a passing cloud as free from danger as the heavens are free, from pain and toil. There would they build and be, and sail about the world to seas unheard and of and, of and unseen. Oh, were they but a bird. So think they, while they listen to its song and smile and fancy, and so pass along, while its low nest, moist with the dews of morn, lies safely with the leveret in the corn. <clears throat> the darkling thrush. I know what's on there if we can get to it. There we go. The Darkling Thrush by Thomas Hardy. I leaned upon a coppice gate when frost was specter gray, and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled vine stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all manhood that haunted high had sought their household fires. The land's sharp features seemed to be the century's corpse out lean. Its crypt, the cloudy canopy, the wind, its death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken hard and dry. And every spirit upon earth seemed flavorless, fervorless as I. At once a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead and a full-hearted evening song of joy unlimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, in blast beruffled be plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around, that I could think there trembled though his happy good night air, some blessed hope whereof he knew, and I was unaware.
Saginaw Bay, I keep going back. Do you have that one? Okay. He dazzles you right out of the water, right out of the moon, the sun and fire, cocksure, smooth talker, good looker. Raven makes a name for himself up and down the coast from Nass River, stirs things up. Hurling the first light, it lodges in the ceiling of the sky. Everything takes form. Creatures flee to forest animals, hide in fur. Some choose the sea, turn to salmon, always escaping. Those remain in the light, stand as men, dumb and full of fears. Raven turns his head and laughs in amazement, then dives off the landscape, dividing the air into moment before an instant after. He moves north, Kuyu Island, Saginaw Bay, wind country, rain country, its voices trying to rise through fog, the long tongue of the sea sliding beneath the bay. Raven is taken in by it all. Sticky mud flats, house clams squirting, rock pool water bugs skidding, bulge-eyed bullheads staring through shadow, incessant drizzle hissing, oil slick raven fixed against the glossy surface of infinity. The Wind Hover by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Oh, good. I caught this morning morning's minion Kingdom of Daylight's Dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon in his riding of the rolling level underneath him, steady air and striding high there. How he rung upon the rain of a wimpling wind in his ecstasy, and then off, off, forth on swing as the skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend. The hurl and gliding rebuff the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing, brute beauty and valor, an act, oh, air, pride, plume, here, buckle. And the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, oh, my chevalier. No wonder of it. Sheer plod makes plow down cillion shine, and blue bleak embers, ah, my dear, fall, gall themselves, and gash gold vermilion. Just one comment I'm not about to read. <laughs> um, that is a poem that we particularly associate with Jim Curry and many others by Gerard Manley Hopkins, which seem almost impossible to read. Mary has done it wonderfully, but they are such a challenge, and he did them all so wonderfully. This poem is Snowy Owl near Ocean Shores, and the poet grew up in western Washington State, so that might help with a location of where he made this observation. <clears throat> Snowy Owl near Ocean Shores by Duane Neatum. A castaway blown south from the Arctic tundra sits on a stump in an abandoned farmer's field Beyond the dunes, cattails toss and bend as snappy as the surf, rushing and crashing down the jetty. His head a swivel of round glances, his eyes a deeper yellow than the winter sun. He wonders if the spot 200 feet away is a mouse on the crawl from mud hole to deer grass patch. An hour of wind and sleet whips the air. 
nothing darts or passes but the river underground. A North Pole creature shows us how to last. The wind ruffles his feathers from crown to claw while he gazes into zeros, the salt slick rain. As a double rainbow before us arc sky and owl, we leave him surrendering to the echo of his white refrain. A Brief History of the Passenger Pigeon by Lynn Pedersen. Okay. Not to be confused with messenger pigeons, birds sent behind enemy lines in war, but think passengers as in birds carrying suitcases, sharing a berth on a train, or traveling in bamboo cages on a ship, always migrating on a one way to extinction. How would extinction look on a graph? A steady climb or a plateau, then a precipitous cliff at the dawn of humans? Nesting grounds, 800 square miles in area, skies swollen with darkening multitudes, days and days of unbroken flocks passing over. Ectopistus migratorius. And the last of the species, Martha, named for Martha Washington, dies in a cage in 1914 at the Cincinnati Zoo. Forget clemency, we are the worst kind of predator, not even deliberate in our destruction. Our killing happens a la carte on the side, side of dodo. And because the 19th century did not enlist a battlefield artist for extinctions, there are no official witnesses to the slaughter, just participants. If you could somehow travel back to this scene through the would-be canvas, you would run flailing your arms toward the hardwood forests and the men with sticks and guns and boiling sulfur pots to bring birds out of the trees as if you could deliver 50,000 individual warnings or throw yourself prostrate on the ground as if your one body could hold sway. We have wild geese up there. <laughs> What's your title? Wild geese. Wild geese. By Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese. Harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. He Reproofs the Curlew by W.B. Yeats. Oh, 
Oh, right there. <laughs> oh, Curlew, cry no more in the air, or only to the water in the west, because your crying brings to my mind passion dim eyes and long heavy hair that was shaken out over my breast. There is enough evil in the crying of the wind. This is our last poem, and it has a lot of readers. <laughs> okay. Letters from a Father by Mona Van Dyne. Ulcerated tooth keeps me awake. There is such pain. Would have to go to the hospital to have it pulled, or would bleed to death from the blood thinners. But can't leave mother. She falls and forgets her salve and her tranquilizers. Her ankles swell so, and her bowels are so bad. She almost had a stoppage, and sometimes what she passes is green as grass. There are big holes in my thigh where my leg brace buckles the size of dimes. My head pounds from the high pressure. It is awful not to be able to get out, and I fell in the bathroom, and the girl could hardly get me up at all. Sure thought my back was broken. It will be next time. Prostate is bad, and my and heart has given out feel bloated after supper, have made my peace just because I'm plain done for, and have no doubt that the Lord will come any day with my release. You say you enjoy your feeder. I don't see why you want to spend good money on grain for birds. And you say you have a hundred sparrows? I'd buy poison and get rid of their diseases and turds. We enjoyed your visit. It was nice of you to bring the feeder, but a terrible waste of your money for that big bag of feed, since we won't be living more than a few weeks long. We can see them good where, from where we sit, big ones and little ones. But you know, when I farmed, I used to like to hunt, and we had many a good meal from pigeons and quail and pheasant. But these birds won't be good for nothing and are dirty to have so near the house. Mother likes the red birds, though. My bad knee is so sore, and I can't hardly hear, and Mother says she is hoarse from yelling. But I know it's too late for a hearing aid. I belch up all the time and have a sore mouth, and of course, with my heart, it's no use to go to a doctor. Mother is the same, has a scab she thinks is going to turn to a wart. The birds are eating and fighting, ha <laughs> ha All shapes and colors and sizes coming out of our woods, but we don't know what they are. Your mother hopes you can send us a kind of book that tells about birds. This, there is one that folks call snowbirds. They eat on the ground. We had the girl sprinkle extra there, but say they eat something awful. I sent the girl to town to buy some more food. She had to go anyway. Almost called you on the telephone, but it costs so much to call, thought better write. See, the funniest thing is happening. One day we had so many birds, and they fight and get excited at their feed, you know, and it's something to watch. And two or three flew right at us and crashed into our window, and bang, poor little things knocked themselves silly. They come to after a while on the ground and flew away. They had been doing that. We felt awful and didn't know what to do about it. The other day, a lady from our church drove out to call, and a little bird knocked itself out while she sat, and she brought it in her hands right into the house. It looked like dead. 
It had some kind of hat of feathers sticking up out of its head, kind of rose and pinky color. Don't know what it was. And I petted it, and it come to life right there in her hands, and she took it out, and it flew. She says she thinks the window is, they think the window is part of the sky on a fair day. She feeds birds too, but hasn't got so many. She says to hang strips of aluminum foil in the window, so they'll, we'll do that. And she raved about our birds. P.S. The book just come in the mail. Say, that book is sure good. I study it every day and enjoy our birds. Some of them I can't identify for sure. I guess they're females, the Latin words I just skip over. Bet you'd never guess the sparrow I've got here. How sparrow you wrote, but I have. Fox sparrows, song sparrows, vesper sparrows, pine woods and tree and chipping and white throat and white crown sparrows. I have six cardinals, three pairs. They come at early morning and night, the males at the feeder and on the ground, the females, juncos, maybe 25, they fight for the ground. That's what they used to call snowbirds. I miss the bluebirds since the weather warmed. Their breast is the color of a good ripe muskmelon. Tufted titmouse is a sort of blue with a little tiny crest. And I have flicker and red-bellied and red-headed woodpeckers. You would die laughing to see the red-bellied. He hangs on with his head flat on the board, his tail braced up and under, wing out. And Dick Sissel, and ruby-crowned kinglet, and nuthatch stands on his head, and very on top, <clears throat> the color of a bird dug. And hermit thrush with spot on breast, Blue Jay so funny, he will hop right on the back of the other birds to get the grain. We bought some sunflower seeds just for him. And purple finch, I bet you've never seen, color of a watermelon, sets on a rim of the feeder with his streaky wife. And the squirrels, you know, they're cute too. They sit tall and eat with their little hands. They eat buckets full. I pulled my own tooth. It didn't bleed at all. <laughs> it's sure a surprise how well mother's doing. She forgets his laxative, but bows, moves fine. Now that windows are open, she says our birds sing all day. The girl took a book of knowledge on loan from the library, and I am reading up on the habits of birds. Did you know some males have three wives? Some are great, some don't. I'm going to keep feeding all spring, maybe summer. You can see that they expect it. We will need thistle seed for goldfinch and pine siskin next winter. Some folks are going to come see us from church. Some bird watchers pretty soon. They have birds in town, but nothing to echo this. So the world woos its children back for an evening kiss. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry we kind of didn't get all of the poems up to the library, but uh, I appreciate your coming. All of us do. And uh, we'll see you next year for Poetry Month again, I guess.